Hi, I'm Leo Girard, the international president of our union, your union, the United Steelworkers. Let me start by apologizing for not being able to be with you at this important District 3 conference. Unfortunately, I'll be in Washington fighting against more rotten trade deals with our Rapid Response Conference and our Good Jobs, Green Jobs Conference where we'll be trying to convince members of the United States House of Representatives and Senate to not vote for a process called Fast Track, which would give uh, clearance to passing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which we believe will cost jobs. And uh, we'll be there with probably five to 600 of our members knocking on congresspersons' doors. But let me start off a, the second part of my comments by saying how proud I am of the work that District 3 is doing, District 3 director, the District 3 staff, the District 3 local unions, the District 3 membership. The work that you've done is first class, and I want to refer to just some of those issues, but not necessarily all of them, because I know as local union leaders, you deal with issues every day, from collective bargaining to grievance handling to health and safety. But I want to mention to you a few particular issues that I think District 3 has done a tremendous job on and is leading not just our union in Canada, but in many ways leading our union overall. I want to talk about the abuse of temporary foreign workers. It was District 3 and your district director, Steve Hunt, that jumped on the issue of HD mining when we found out that they were going to mine in a coal mine and were advertising for workers and one of the criteria was they needed to speak Mandarin. As we jumped into that issue as a union led by your director, we found that after they paid labor brokers, after they got their jobs, after they subtracted what they would have to do to pay back labor br brokers, they were going to barely make above five or six dollars an hour. Then we were told we didn't have the skills to have Canadians do that job. I'm from the mining industry. Ken Newman is from the mining industry. Danielle Roy is from the mining industry. Steve Hunt is from the mining industry. And we all know that we could have trained miners well in advance to do that work. We all know that we could train miners now to do that work in the future. And if there's a manpower shortage, we shouldn't fill it with temporary foreign workers who are going to be abused, have their passports held, and not have an ability to speak up. We're not against immigration. If there's going to be jobs like there have been in past years where there's been immigration, then those workers should get the full rights to come to Canada and become full members and, in fact, become members of our union if they're going to work in the mining industry. So, again, that issue was brought to the forefront by District 3, but then it spread across the country. It spread to finding out that we had people working in Tim Hortons who were brought in as temporary foreign workers being housed four and five and six to a housing complex, having to pay rent for a place that uh, took away their basically most of their earnings. We found that there were people from banks that were being laid off while they were bringing in temporary foreign workers. And that issue has been in the forefront and has been kept alive by the work of our union, District 3, but other districts in our union. And again, you should be complimented for that ability that you had to find that issue and keep it alive. I also want to talk about the Stop the Killing, Enforce the Law. Many of you, many of you participated in our multi-year struggle. It took the Steelworkers Union 10 years and numerous attempts to get this bill passed through the federal government, through the federal system. And once we did, 10 years later, when we look at what we've managed to accomplish, which was pretty good legislation, we find that there's been barely any enforcement of that legislation. In fact, we find that most of the people, in whether it was occupational health and safety branches or in police forces that would investigate these fatalities, didn't know how to do it, didn't know what they were looking for. Our union has held forums all over the country, and in fact, in British Columbia, we've had more than 50 towns and cities small and large, pass resolutions supporting our Stop the Killing, Enforce the Law campaign, and we've spread it across the country. Again, this is an idea that came to fruition at a District 3 Health and Safety Conference, and our union from coast to coast to coast 
has been active in this program. We haven't accomplished everything that we want to accomplish yet with that program because what we need, and again, what we need is for whoever is going to be doing the investigation to be able to look at this with a critical eye and where the law has been violated that has resulted in people's serious injuries or death, unfortunate death, we ought to make sure that those people pay the ultimate price. It's unacceptable that we've had issues where a thousand people a year might get killed by traumatic incidents in their workplace, yet the only penalty that has been applied is a financial fine. We're not opposed to the fines, of course, you should have a fine if you're doing that kind of irresponsible behavior. But it shouldn't stop there. That individual should be forced to defend his or herself in a court of law. Why would they not face the same consequences as people from the general public do? So again, District 3 has led the way, has led our union so that from coast to coast to coast, we're fighting to enforce the Westray Bill and to finally make them understand the best way to stop the killing is to enforce the law. I also want to comment on the most recent developments in the Babine and Lakeland coroner's inquest. We had our members injured, killed, burnt up, traumatically affected, whether it was by a fatality and how that would affect the family or God bless some of the workers that were so badly injured they could never return to work. As more and more evidence came out during the inquest, it became clear the level of incompetence that went on in both the WorkSafe BC investigation and the so-called investigation by the police and the fact that the company hired their own private forensic investigator to see if they could find a way to switch the blame. Our union pulled out of that inquest and is now in full gear to demand an inquiry where you'd have to appear before a judge and tell the truth. Most people don't know this, but I'm sure Director Hunt will expand much more than I can. The police investigation that should have resulted in a much more detailed report. On the stand, it was agreed that that investigation was done by reviewing the reports from WorkSafe BC, which already was a botched investigation, inadequate. We've got documentation that says a month or more before the explosion at Lakeland, that after the explosion in Babine, said that dust was a major issue, but they didn't order the cleanup. What the hell is going on when an inspector goes into a workplace, sees how dangerous it is, files a report, and no one follows up and no one orders a cleanup. Again, the role of our union, whether it was immediately after the explosions, were just traumatic, traumatic incidences for the community. Our members got the benefit, if that's what you want to call it, of sending in our emergency response team. We, in fact, had folks from Anacortes, Washington, who had gone through a fatality where seven of their members were killed, had experience. They came up to help out with the emergency response of talking to our members and their families and helping with get, the, get them through these very difficult periods of time. Our union never gave up on the demand for an inquiry. The compromise that the government agreed to and that WorkSafe BC agreed to was a long overdue inquest. But we've now seen the results of that inquest is inadequate information, it's inadequate investigation, it's inadequate reporting, and too many people trying to cover their ass. So I think it's now important, and I'm sure that it'll come up at your conference, that in District 3 in British Columbia, that we launch a massive effort to get an inquiry that's going to have people testifying under oath and getting to the truth of what would happen if people had been given the advance warning to clean up the workplace rather than ignore that. So I urge all of you, whether you're from British Columbia or not, but as part of District 3, help us in District 3 in British Columbia to mobilize, to get to the communities, to get community campaigns, that we demand a full inquiry so that we can get to the root of what happened, that we can get the results, 
and we can take whatever steps we need to take to make sure this never happens again. Not only never in British Columbia, but never in any one of our workplaces, whether it's a sawmill or whether it's a coal mine, any facility. We know, we've known for a long time that dust causes explosions. Whether it's grain dust, sugar dust, wood dust, coal dust, you go through a whole bunch of them. There's no secret. The world knows that. Why didn't we get told? Why didn't our members get told? So again, let me just say this. I'm sure this will come up in your conference. This is a crucial battle we need to have. The inquest isn't getting to the truth by the kind of stuff that's been said. Too many people doing too much to cover their own ass. What we need to do is have a fight for an inquiry and hold them accountable so that people, when they go to work, know they can come home safe. 2015 is also going to be a tremendously important political year in Canada. This year, there'll be an election in our federal government. This year is our opportunity to finally get rid of Stephen Harper. I don't need to go through all of the things that Stephen Harper has done since he's had his majority and the things he tried to do when he was in the minority. I've often said to some of my friends in the U.S., we had a tea party in Canada before there was ever a thought about a Tea Party in the United States. Our problem is our Tea Party was called the Reform Party, and Stephen Harper was a crucial member of that party and helped bring about the radical right-wing agenda that he's been promoting. Whether it's an attack on unions, whether it's an attack on our social infrastructure of our Canada Pension Plan, whether it's attack on health care, all of the things that the right-wing in the U.S. have been promoting have been on Stephen Harper's agenda for a long time. Our opportunity to get rid of him at the ballot box comes this fall. And I know that District 3 with Steelworker Votes has been building a program. I know how important our union is to the New Democratic Party. Our union is one of the founding unions of the New Democratic Party. And at the time that we founded this party, we knew that it would be a voice that would bring progressive values to the legislative arena on a national scale. You don't hear them talking about we end up with national health care because of Tommy Douglas and what was then the CCF. We look at Canada Pension brought about by the CCF and the NDP. So we look at all of those things and we know how important they've been to the future development of our country then and the future development that we're going to have now. Tom Mulcair is a qualified, well-respected voice for Canadian workers. Tom Mulcair has the opportunity to become the first New Democratic Prime Minister of Canada. We need to help him do that. The NDP agenda is an agenda that helps people, not an agenda that hurts people. The NDP agenda is one that will help us build for the future, not just for our generation, but for the next generation. We all know what the Liberals do. The Liberals run on the left and govern on the right. We need to make sure that we expose Justin Trudeau has nothing more than a nice hairdo. He's shallow. He doesn't have any core values. He doesn't have any core principles. We know what Stephen Harper is. He's a right-wing ideologue and the stuff that he's done, including his anti-terrorism bill that would in fact have workers protesting legitimately viewed as terrorists if the system wanted to do so. So again, let me urge you to understand that 2015 is a year for us to make history. It's a year for the Steelworkers Union and our leaders and our members to contribute to the historic events that will happen when we elect the first NDP federal government. We can do it. And I'm sure that Director Hunt and Director Newman will talk about that with you. I want to praise our union in District 3, District 6, District 5, and the National Office for putting together a tremendous agenda of how we're going to contribute to the political battle to elect an NDP government. But nothing is more important than the Steelworker Votes program that we've been building and have been building in District 3 now for quite some time. It's a model of how we build from the grassroots up and how we then use that grassroots mobilization to educate our members, to educate their families, to educate our communities, and to build the kind of social infrastructure that will allow us to elect a progressive government led by Thomas Mulcair. I'm excited about the future. I'm excited about the opportunity. And we can only do it if we put our nose to the grindstone and demand 
that we get a voice and participate in the system, and the only people that will give us that opportunity will be the new Democrats. Also, let me welcome the members of the local 1944 of the Telecommunication Workers Union, who are probably now attending their first official Steelworker District Conference. It was a proud moment when more than 13,000 members of the TWU were given the opportunity to merge with our union. It was a proud moment when we saw the percentage positive vote for the merger with our union. Now we have to meet our collective responsibility of making sure that we provide the kind of training and development to the TWU Local 1944 membership that we committed to. It's important that we understand that District 3 has a very aggressive local union education program, that our national office supplements that program with professional training, whether it's a building power program or collective action on contract action teams as we move forward. It's a proud time in our union when 13,000 members get to join our union and we get to work hard every day to make their life a better life. I want to congratulate the TWU members who are there, encourage you to participate full-heartedly in the steelworker programs, whether it's the kinds of things I talked about of demanding a meaningful inquiry on workplace fatalities in Babine and Lakeland, whether it's helping us fight the abuse of temporary foreign workers, whether it's about us working to expand and develop our organizing program and to do the kind of work that we need to build a strong union that will have a strong voice in the political process, whether it's in one province or another, or whether it's federally. Our union is proud of the work that we do. We're proud of the fact that more unions have merged with us than with any other union. We're proud of the fact that we stand up and we fight back we're proud of the fact that we develop our membership and ask them to be motivated and educated so that they can relate to the struggles that we have together. So I want to close by once again apologizing for not being able to be there, but saying that you have tremendous amount of success in the work that you've already done, but we never will stop working until we have victory for everyone. We have important upcoming negotiations in the near future, maybe going on right now with Shah and getting ready for TELUS in the TWU. It's important that we do the building power program. It's important that we build the infrastructure and all the issues I've talked about. Let me close by saying, Solidarity Works. Have a great conference. Solidarity Works. Thank you.